So, welcome to your first online lecture. Um, the lecture is going to be divided up into several parts, and I will show you next what will be covered in each of those parts. The agenda for this lecture and what we'll cover in this first part is uh, shown in red, and what we'll cover in subsequent parts is shown in black. The agenda is to review the four macromolecules found in cells, talk about the role of proteins, we're going to do that fairly briefly, talk about amino acids, which are, which are the building blocks or monomers of protein, and we're going to describe their structure and their classification. It's very, very important information for biology students or science students in general. Then we're going to talk about uh, how amino acids are connected into peptides and how peptides um, actually form proteins. So what we're going to cover in this part of the lecture is shown in red. So what is a macromolecule? A macromolecule is any large organic molecule consisting of smaller molecules. Another way of describing it is to say that it is a polymer made of organic monomers. Remember, an organic molecule is one that consists primarily of carbon and hydrogen. The four macromolecules found in cells are proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, that includes DNA, and RNA, and finally, carbohydrates. So what do proteins do? And the answer to that is actually very, very difficult. You could spend your entire career as uh, biology students answering that question. Um, but we're going to try to zoom in on uh, one way of generalizing or categorizing that. So one of the things that proteins do in biological systems is they serve defense roles. So if you think about your own body and when it is invaded by something foreign, such as a pathogenic virus or a pathogenic bacterium, our immune systems respond. And our immune systems respond in a variety of ways. One is by producing what are called antibodies and a number of other useful chemicals, for example, complement, which is a type of protein made by our immune system. These are very useful. They work together and separately to fight off invaders. Another important function that um, proteins perform is in movement. So if you think about your muscle tissue, your muscle tissue contains fibers. The proteins in those fibers are made out of actin and myosin. And these are what make up most of muscle. Another important role for protein, a third role, is signaling. So in order to maintain homeostasis in an animal system, or in order for organisms out in the environment that don't live as multicellular creatures, but uh, individual creatures such as the bacterium, in order for them to live successfully, they need to have ways to communicate with one another. Um, so that allows them to respond appropriately to the environment. So if you think of an example of a signaling protein is one called glucagon. This is an example from your text. It's spelt like this. Okay, and glucagon is a protein that binds to receptor proteins on liver cells. It's a protein-protein interaction. 
And when it does that, it triggers liver, liver cells to release sugar. So that happens in our body when our blood sugar is low, when we get those shakes and it's too long between meals. Glucagon will, glu glucagon will play a role in signaling the liver to release um, blood sugar, helping to stabilize us and thereby maintaining homeostasis. Another important role for proteins is the role of structure. So if you think about your hair or your nails, the protein that's important there is a protein called keratin. They make up, the, the bulk of our hair and nails is made up of keratin. It's a strong structural protein. Um, also, if you think about the fact that um, uh, the cell, uh, cell walls of some organisms contain some proteins, that's another structural role. Or you think about the exoskeleton of uh, insects. A lot of them contain something called um, chitin, but they also contain protein components. Chitin is not actually a protein, but they also contain protein components. Hope I didn't confuse you there. Let's move on to the another, another function of proteins, and that is the role of transport. So cells need to move chemicals in and out, and whole organisms such as ourselves need to move chemicals in and out. The classic example of that, if you think about yourself, is probably the example of hemoglobin. Most of you are familiar with this protein. So this is the protein that uh, catches oxygen, holds oxygen from your lung area, and circulates it to the rest of the body. Transport proteins are abundant in cell membranes if you zoom into the cellular level. And in fact, most cell membranes are about 50% protein. And um, that, sh that protein is there primarily to play a role in transport, although also for some important metabolic functions. So there we've talked about defense, movement, signaling, structure, and transport. And one of the most important roles of protein we haven't talked yet, and that is the role of catalysis. So let's consider that in a little bit more detail because this first part of the class focuses um, on proteins. So catalysis means, or, or catal uh, a ca it means to speed up or promote a reaction. So catalysts, do cat catalysis, and they promote chemical reactions. And there are lots of different types of catalysts out there in the world, different chemicals of, of different uh, structures, but what we're interested in is biology. And in biological systems, in biochemical reactions, catalysis is achieved with the help, primarily, of something called an enzyme or enzymes. And most enzymes are made out of protein. So let's consider a basic chemical reaction. A plus a molecule consisting of two parts. We'll call them BC, but I want you to consider BC one molecule. Let's consider that A and BC are converted to AB and C. Okay, so it's a basic chemical reaction. On the left, we have what are called reactants. On the right, we have what are called products. I don't have room to write it, but you should also note that reactants is a term that is used interchangeably with the term substrates when you're talking about biological or biochemical reactions. So here we have two kinds of chemicals going into a reaction, two kinds coming out. The arrow is shown going back and forth, and that shows that this reaction is reversible. And in fact, most chemical reactions are reversible, most biological reactions are reversible, even if it's just to a small degree. So let's talk a little bit about energy and chemical reactions. Essentially, chemical reactions are energy transformations. So we're really interested for primarily in the energy that is stored within chemical bonds. In order to convert reactants, here A plus BC, into products, here AB plus C, you need to break the chemical bond connecting B and C, and then reform a chemical bond to, or form a new chemical bond between A and B. In spontaneous or energy yielding reactions, the free energy, which is the stored chemical energy found in the bonds 
internal to the chemicals or the molecules that are important here, free energy is shown on the vertical axis, sorry, here. The free energy of the reactants must be greater than the free energy of the products. That's a characteristic of spontaneous or energy yielding reactions. Those are the only kinds of reactions that enzymes catalyze. Now in order for A plus BC, the reactants, to be converted to the products shown, you need to go through a transition state. And the transition state is shown here. It's a temporary state, uh, very unstable, that the reactants need to proceed through in order to form products. So that's what needs to happen in order for this chemical bond to be broken in this reaction, thereby allowing this chemical bond to be formed. The, in order to achieve the transition state, or the process of achieving the transition state, is there is an energy barrier to that process, and it is referred to as the activation energy, or Ea, which is the energy of activation. Now what enzymes can do is they can alter the Ea. They can, in fact, reduce the Ea for spontaneous reactions. So this is a model of how proteins can work as enzymes. We're still really learning a lot about this. So the green blob is a protein enzyme, okay? So that is a protein enzyme. These little pockets here, 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 and here, they're really important. They are a region called the active site. Okay, And the active site is the part of the protein enzyme that binds the reactants, also known as substrates. So that's a very specific binding site. Notice how the size and the shape of the reactants fits perfectly into the active site. So the reactants bind then notice that the protein changes shape in this middle. And when it does that, it stresses the bond that used to connect BC, and it helps uh, facilitate the breaking of that bond. Once that happens, you've achieved the transition state, and then it's a very spontaneous reaction, and will continue uh, onwards, and we're left with the products that we looked at before, the product AB and the product C, and those products do not have a strong affinity or tendency to bind to the active site. So they are released from those active site pockets and the enzyme is left intact and able to catalyze another reaction. And again, the overall effect of this is when you have a reaction that is proceeding with the help of a protein enzyme, the energy of activation is reduced. Okay. Note that the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products is the same, okay? It's the energy of activation that changes, only the energy of activation. Now that delta G value is something we'll talk about in the future when we learn more about enzymes, but I think it's important to hear these concepts multiple times and um, repeat them several times for you, and I wanted to give you a brief introduction to this now as we started to talk about what proteins do. I'm now going to close this part of the lecture and then you can move on to the next part, part two.